Welcome to the Academy of Light. In this session, we are going to talk about the awesome power of speech and uh, how that we need to be disciplined. If we're going to handle the authority that God wants to give us in this hour, our speech has to become disciplined. And God has to be able to trust us with authority, trust us with the things that we say. And so as we come on down to these end times, this is one thing that God really is going to require of us. God's going to give the church real authority. Real authority. Authority that has consequences. For instance, in Revelation chapter 3, verse 21, it says, To him that overcomes, I will grant to sit with me upon my throne. That's awesome responsibility. Even as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. So he's talking about incredible responsibility, incredible authority. And in Revelation again, chapter 2, in verse 26, it says, He that overcometh and keepeth my words to the end, to him will I give, listen to this, power over the nations. Power over the nations. Can you imagine that? Power over the nations. God's going to give us power over the nations. Power to rule. Power to govern. There's another scripture in Revelation 2 and verse 27. It says, And he shall rule them with a rod of iron as vessels of a potter. Shall they be broken, even as I received of my father. And then in Revelation 5 and verse 10, it says, And hath made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. It says we shall reign on the earth. That's awesome responsibility. That's awesome power. That's, that's awesome authority. And so we, now we are in training here. God is determining whether he can trust us. We're in training now to exercise authority. Authority which has awesome consequences. For instance, in the, in the early church, we read the story in Acts chapter 5 and verse 1 of Ananias and Sapphira. Let's read it. It says, But a certain man named Ananias and Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. Verse 2, and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? While it remained, was it not your own? After it was sold, it was not in thine own power. Why has you conceived this thing in your heart? You has not lied unto men, but unto God. And it says, And Anasai, hearing these words, fell down, gave up the ghost, and great fear came, all, came on all of them that heard these things. Now, his wife came in a little bit later, and Peter spoke just simple words about the same thing that's happened to your husband will now happen to you. And she fell down dead. What Peter spoke actually came to pass. See, life and death are in the power of the tongue. And what Peter spoke came to pass. This is authority with awesome consequences. You know? God rules by the spoken word. He rules by the words which he speaks. You know, when Moses struck the rock, something unusual was happening here. It says in Numbers chapter 20 and verse 8, and the, and the rod, take the rod, and gather thou and the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother, and speak unto the rock before their eyes, and it shall give forth water. Now Moses had done this before, you know. He, the Lord told him to strike the rock, and he struck the rock, and water came out. Now he's saying, Moses, speak to this rock, and water will come out of it. That's what the scripture said. And then Moses was quite, got quite angry with the people and what was going on. In Numbers 20 and verse 11 it says, And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod he smote the rock twice. 
and water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank. You see, the authority that Moses had was awesome, but he didn't do what God told him to do. He didn't speak the words God told him to speak. He, there were consequences to what he did. He didn't get into the promised land, at least at that time. He never crossed Jordan. He died on this side of Jordan. Because he spoke, he had awesome authority, and it would work regardless of the words that he spoke or what he did. But it wasn't what God told him to do. You see, the rock was a type of Christ, and he smoked the rock and twice and, and ruined the type. Now, it's like what you say has consequences. This is a kind of a, a frightening thing, you know. Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 21 says, you know, power, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Think about it. How many times have you spoken today? What are the words which you have spoken to other people? What are the words which you have spoken to yourself? Death and life flow out of your mouth today. There's no neutral ground in this. Whatever you said produces life or produces death. It is positive or it is negative. You know, the Bible says we are made in the image and the likeness of God. What does that really mean? Well, that word image is an interesting Hebrew word and it means a phantom or an illusion. It was denoting the spiritual qualities of man. We may like God. God is a spirit. We have spirit qualities within us. We have an inner person, an inner being. We are made in the image, the phantom, like the phantom of God. And his likeness, it says. You see, his likeness denotes a physical resemblance, a shape. We are shaped like God. We look like God. We have arms and a head and legs and we look like God. We are made in the image and the likeness of God. Now David asked this question, what is man? Why are you so interested in man? It, it's recorded in Psalm 8 and verse 4. What is man that you are mindful of him? And verse 5, for what thou hast made him a little lower than the angels and hast crowned him with glory and honor. What is man that thou art mindful of him? It says, he made him a little lower than the angels. That's a bad translation. Because this word angel in the scripture is the word Elohim. It's the word for God. He made him a little lower than God. Crowned him with glory and honor. And then in verse 8, uh, sorry, verse 6, it says, You made him to have dominion. So David said, What is man? He gets inspiration, then flows as he is writing. You made him a little lower than God. You made him to have dominion. You crowned him with great glory and honor, great dominion. You see, man has God-like qualities. He's inherited from God. You don't have to be born again to have this. We are all human beings are made in the image. And it says, and the likeness of God. And uh, God is a creator. And he creates with words that are spoken. And man has inherited that ability, whether you're born again or not. Our words are creative. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. This is one of the most fundamental realities of life. Now we really need to get a handle on this. We, we really need to understand this. Our words, the words that we speak, transcend this natural realm. And they have a direct influence on the unseen realm. Everything you say has a direct influence on the unseen realm. Now think about that. You know, human beings are very vocal creatures. That everything we say has an impact 
on the spirit realm. It has an impact on the unseen realm. And you know, um, there are three dimensions to the physical world. You know, three dimensions, like, which there's a line, a plane, if you like, a plane or a line. It, there is height, that's another dimension. There is depth, a 3D dimension, there is depth. We see everything in, in three dimensions. However, there is another dimension. And that is the fourth dimension. That is the realm of spirit. And it is the spirit spiritual dimension that governs the physical dimension and words that we speak are the interacting catalyst between these two realms the physical world and the unseen world it is words that are the catalyst which affect the unseen world words interact in that way now the Bible tells us in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis 1 verse 1. And in verse 2. And the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the earth. So here we have a coetic, a coetic world. It's, it's like nothing is really formed. And God said, listen to this. God said, let there be light. Just a spoken word. And there was light. The physical world was brought into being by the words that God spoke. The unseen realm formed into a physical entity. Now you and I are made in the image and likeness of God. We have God-like qualities. And the words that we speak have a direct impact and influence on the unseen realm. We are all in the image and likeness of God, and we are creators. And the way that we create is by how we think, how we feel, what we say. Has a direct impact on the physical world. There are three basic spiritual forces in the earth. These forces are the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Man, and the spirit of Satan. Three dimensions, three, three spiritual influences, if you like, for want of a better word, in the world today. And uh, whole, the whole, these are mentioned in the first three chapters of the book of Genesis, right at the beginning, the spirit of man, the Holy Spirit of God, uh, and, and the spirit of Satan. These entities affected the whole of coming generations they affected the whole of history. What would happen in this world, the directions it would take, what would happen would be affected by these three physical and the spiritual entities. The spirit of man would have an influence, the spirit of God would have an influence, and of course the spirit of Satan would have an influence. And so there are consequences to the words that we speak. We were made to control our environment. You see, the unseen realm responds to our words. Not just to our words, but our, to our feelings and to our thoughts. But feelings and thoughts give way to words in the end. And so the unseen realm responds immediately to our spoken words, thoughts, emotions, desires have a profound effect upon the world around us. Now, Satan has taught the New Age movement how to manipulate, how to use these laws. You know, when Satan fell, he had profound knowledge of the ways of God. He was very close to God. He was a very high-ranking angel. Knew much of the mysteries of God and uh, insight into the universe. In fact, Ezekiel 28 describes the fall of Lucifer. And it tells us this in Ezekiel 28 and verse 3. Behold, you are wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that they can hide from you. Talking about Lucifer. With your wisdom and with your understanding, you have gotten you riches, gotten gold and silver into your treasures. Son of man... 
Say unto the prince of Tyrus, who is a type of Satan, Thus saith the Lord God, Because thine heart is lifted up, and you have said, I am a God. I sit in the seat of God. See, that's exactly what Satan teaches the New Age movement. You are God. You don't need God. You don't need Jesus. We are God. That's the essence of, of New Age teaching. And we can use our creative abilities to create whatever we want. And so, you know, New Age seminars deal with this all of the time. How to gain wealth through these principles. Visualization, dreaming. They're all New Age techniques. And they work to an extent because man is creative. But you see, the difference between the New Age and the New Testament is this. It all comes down to the independent use of these abilities. The independent use of these laws. The motive for using these laws. Operating out of our own will and direction. You see, when Moses got angry and struck the rock, it still worked. You see, the New Age movement uses these principles and to a degree they work. Satan has insight and knowledge into the ways of God and into how much human beings are creative. Yeah, the rock responded and gave the water. But you see, Moses stepped outside of the will of God at that instance. In the New Age, you become your own God. You can learn to manipulate matter, learn to become wealthy, learn to master the physical realm. And basically, it's another form of Hinduism. But the principles are the same. The Bible draws a line when he sends, says this, sons of God with great authority must be led by the Spirit of God. Jesus said of mine own self, I don't do anything by myself. What I see the Father do, that's what I do. You see, you know when you move in a word of knowledge and healing, where did that come from? That word of knowledge comes from the Spirit of God. That is insight into the will of God at that moment. Somebody there in the meeting or someone here in your home is sick. You have a word of knowledge. That word of knowledge comes from the Spirit of God to you to do something about it. Now, when you align yourself with the will of God and speak those words, the power of God flows, you see, to bring healing. The church is so easily slips into New Age by seeking to use spiritual resources for what they want. That's New Age, what you want. You become God. You decide what you want. You decide what's good for you. You decide how much wealth you want. All of these things. You say, well, it's in the Bible, it must be the will of God. Everything in the Bible is the will of God, so we can find any scripture in the Bible, and we can start to speak it out, and it's the will of God, and it will come to pass. That is not necessarily so. Now, we need to understand this. You see, the Bible says there are times and seasons for everything. And everything that God wants to do is in a time, a right time, and a right season. You can't just name it because it's in the Bible and then claim it. If it has to be His Word, you see, it has to be His Word that comes out of your mouth. His Word has to be His will to everything. Ecclesiastes 3 and verse 1, there's a time and a season to every purpose under heaven. Ecclesiastes 3 and verse 3, a time to kill and a time to heal. When you move in a word of knowledge... The time and the season has come. And you're in the will of God. And when you speak, you pray, you speak. Let those words, creative words, flow. And something begins to happen. Because we are creative beings. To everything, there's a time and a season. And it goes on to say in Ecclesiastes 3.11, says, And he has made everything 
beautiful or just right in its time. A few years ago I was listening or uh, watching a film of T.L. Osborne. It was in the early or uh, late early 50s and he called a lot of blind people up onto the stage where he was ministering, the big outdoor audit auditorium. He called a lot of these people up, you see, and he said, they're all blind. Then he got the witch doctors up and he said, I want you all the witch doctors to pray for these blind people and heal them. And then he said, before they do, if they can't heal them, and when I pray, if God heals them, will you serve God? And who is the true living God? And so, it was set, the stage was set for this, and so they went into the rich doctor's prayer for about 15, 20 minutes, nothing happened. Then T.L. Osborne went down the line and prayed for each one, and everyone received their sight. It was a time and a season. You see, this was the age, this was a particular age of the healing movement, the 1948 movement, and it was a time when God had ordained the... Uh, a healing evangelism, power evangelism. And uh, when he spoke those words, being in the moment, in the will of time, and in the moment of God, incredible things began to happen. We are coming into a time and a season just like, like right now. And those who understand the power of their words, when they're synced with God, in the moment and in the time and in the will of God, their spoken words have tremendous authority to change nations, to change cities, to bring healing. Creative miracles will begin to happen. You see, authority belongs to the mature sons of God. Sons of God are led by the Spirit of God. You see, in Hebrews 5.14 it says, Strong meat belongs to them that are of a full age, even by those who, by reason of use, have their senses exercised to discern good and evil, or to discern the will of God. Their senses, their organ of perception. You know, these it says in Hebrews 6, 5, who have tasted of the powers of the world to come. Strong meat belongs to them. In the Bible, Jesus said, my meat is to do the will of God and to finish the task that he gave me to do. John 4 and verse 34. See, the powers of the age to come are going to be released in ever-increasing intensities in our life. But sons of God have to be led by the Spirit of God. And so we need to understand this as we come on down to the end of the age. You know, the Bible tells this very interesting thing in, in, in the book of Daniel. When Daniel was praying, this angel came to him and he said, Angel Gabriel, he said, Daniel, I've come because of your words. And, and, and it's kind of thinking, well, it's an incredible thing. Daniel 10, 12, he said, Thy words were heard, and I have come for your words. Your words are very powerful. God wants to bring us to an understanding of how powerful our words are. He wants to bring us to a time of being disciplined to such a degree that we can walk constantly in the will of God. And the words that come out of our mouth are His words and not our words. And His word never returns void. It accomplishes that which He has sent it to do. Let's just pray, shall we? Father, I pray today that this spoken word might find, that it might be seed that might take root in the hearts of your people. That they may understand the times and the seasons in which we are living. They that might understand the tremendous importance of their words. And that they are creative beings. They were made in the image and likeness of God. And the words that they speak have a direct effect on the unseen world. Death and life are in the power of our tongues. I pray, Lord, that you begin to bring your people into a place of discipline. Discipline in their words. Discipline in their thoughts and emotions. That as they sink with you, Lord, that it will be no longer them that live it, but Christ that lives within them. And the words that they speak shall be brought to pass, they shall not return unto them void, 
but they shall accomplish that which is being spoken. Lord, you're training your people now for awesome authority. Before you return, Lord, before the millennium age comes in, you're teaching them to walk in authority, disciplined authority. I pray, Lord, that you'll give us ears to hear. We're going to continue with um, looking at the power of speech and the awesomeness of our words. And so today we're going to go a little deeper in this. You know, when God speaks, something always happens. When God speaks, something is done. When He speaks, it happens. This is one of the most fundamental realities of life and also of us who are made in His image and His likeness. We really need to grasp this and, and understand it. When Jesus spoke, it was so. When God speaks, His word does not return void unto Him. And so we've been looking at how that our words impact the invisible realm and create change in that realm, which then creates change in this physical realm. Now, Mark 11 and verse 23 tells us, For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be cast into the sea, shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. An incredible statement. You know, I used to look at this statement and say, How can that be? And I know many of you have kind of pondered over this statement of Jesus. All you have to do is believe and, and, and you shall have whatsoever you say. Okay, many Christians have stumbled over this. How can this be so? You know, just prior to this, Jesus had been with his disciples and they passed a fig tree and there was no fruit on the tree. And, and Jesus looked at this fig tree and there was nothing there. And he spoke words to that fig tree that it would no longer live. Now, the next day when the disciples came back that same way, they marveled because the, the fig tree was dead. And, and, and they marveled about this. And Jesus said now, he said, For verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall say to this mountain, Not doubt in his heart, but believe those things, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Not only was this just an, exa this, an example uh, to, to the disciples, it was an example to you and I today. Now, we know that Israel, the fig tree spoke about Israel. But let's get past the, that and just look at the principle of this thing. You shall have whatsoever you say. Now, how, how can this be so? In verse 22 of Mark 11, it says, And Jesus said unto them, look, he said, Have the faith of God. In our translation, the King James, it says, Have faith in God. But the literal Greek language says, Have the faith of God. And that really changes this verse. And the key lies in this verse to this whole thing. It's saying, If you have the faith of God, you can say unto this mountain, Be you removed, and it will happen. Because it is not you, it is God in you. The words are not yours, they're his words. That's why Jesus said, I don't do anything unless I see the Father doing it. That's what gave him 100% success, you see. Have the faith of God. You know, Jesus was not saying, if you have faith, you can move this mountain. That's not what he was saying, that's not what he said. He said, if you have the faith of God... You can speak and that mountain will be removed. And it changes the whole picture of this thing. Now we know the Bible tells us that faith cometh by hearing. Romans 10, 17. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now, the word word of God, the word word there is the, the Greek word rima. You see, faith doesn't come by reading the scriptures. Faith comes by having a particular word personally spoken and quickened to you. And it is faith cometh by hearing the Rema word of God. You see, faith comes 
before speaking the word. You can't uh, talk yourself into faith. It's impossible to do that. Faith comes. It wasn't there before. Faith comes by hearing God speak to you, by Him imparting His known will to you, whether it be for that moment or for a long period. Faith comes when He speaks to us. And uh, that's why in John 7, 15, in verse 7, it says, If you abide in me, don't move outside of yourself, just abide in me, and my words, and the word is rima, my spoken word to you, if you abide in me and my words, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. That's John 15, 7. So you couple those scriptures together. You see, if you abide in him, rest in him, don't do anything of yourself. And that, let him speak his word to you. Then you shall ask what you will. You shall speak that word out and it shall be done. You see, we're coming into a time now when the sons of God are going to be coming into such union with the Lord, so one with the Lord, that what they speak will be the Lord speaking through them. And this is how God intended it to be. You see? We do nothing of ourselves. This is how God intended this, this whole thing to work. You know? Whatsoever you shall ask in my name, I will do it, he says in John 14, 13. If you ask anything in my name, it shall be done. Now, his name, asking his, in his name, very simply is asking with his permission. You already have his permission for this thing to happen because he has spoken it into your heart. He has spoken it into your spirit. And you know it was a word from God. You know it was the mind and the will of God. And then whatsoever you ask concerning that thing will be done. You asked in his name. That's with his permission. You see, there's a difference between the New Age and the New Testament. We talked about this in the last session. Their words, you see, are empowered by their fallen nature. Whatever they want. In the New Age, it's a selfish thing. We want wealth. We want this. We want the other. We want all of these things. This is how you get it. It's me, 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 me. You are God. You can create whatever you want. The two kingdoms operate on two opposite poles. One is hate. The other is love. One is lies. The other is truth. One is light. The other is darkness. You see... We need to understand Satan can inspire Rima words as well, spirit quickened words. Because the Bible tells us in Matthew 12 and verse 36, But I say unto you that every idle word, that word, word there is Rima, every idle Rima word that men shall speak, they shall give an account therefore in the day of judgment. For by your words you shall be justified, and by your words you shall be condemned. And you see, that which comes from our fallen nature, that which is inspired by Satan, can be a quickened word. But it's an arima word, a, a word that comes from a spirit source, a word that comes from anger within us, you see, and all that kind of thing that originates in our fallen nature. That's the difference between the New Age and the New Testament. We only want what is the will of God. They want what is their will. You know? In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 4 it says, Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather of giving thanks. That word jesting in the Greek has the thought of Speaking out randomly without thought. Now, that's very interesting. We speak many words all day. How many of it is randomly without thought, you know? We wish we hadn't said that when we think about it later in the day, but we said it, you know, randomly. These words, that, and it's saying, you know, not, not foolish talking or, or jesting. The word jesting is randomly speaking stuff out. We speak in anger or uncleanness and you empower Satan 
to change the world around you. You see, the problem with Christians is found in James 3.10. Out of the same mouth proceeds blessing and cursing. He said, my brethren, this ought not to be so. He said, do the fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Or he said, can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries? Either a vine, can it bear figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. You know? Out of our mouth, Christian's mouth, comes good and evil. Salt water and fresh water. Bitter, sweet. We speak all day, it never ends. But there's death and life in the power of our tongue. And we need to understand that if we're going to carry authority and we're going to start to move in this, the things we say will come to pass. Delegated authority is different from just acting and moving in the faith of God. God delegated authority to Moses. He delegated authority to his disciples and it just happened. And that was before Pentecost. They healed the safe, they cast out demons. That was delegated authority. Now God's going to give us in these end times great measures of delegated authority. But the danger with delegated authority is this, that it will work all of the time for us, whether it's in God or not in God. You see, Adam was Lord of this earth. Everything in the earth, the whole of creation, he was Lord of. Over every atom, every molecule, everything in this planet, Adam was Lord of it. They obeyed him from the tiniest particle to the biggest animal, to the trees, to the wind, obeyed him. Adam could have spoken to a piece of dirt and commanded it to change into gold and it would have happened. You see, because he had dominion over every molecule, those molecules would have just rearranged themselves in a different structure to form gold. I think the atomic number of gold is something like 79. That's how the atoms are arranged to form gold. It's nothing. You see, Adam could have spoken to those, those atomic structures and they would have obeyed him. Jesus spoke and the water turned into wine. The molecules changed, the structure changed. They obeyed him. You know, everything obeyed Adam from the tiniest molecule to the whole animal and creation. And when he fell, when Adam fell, all of that authority, all of that dominion was given to Satan. And he lost it. The whole of creation became under the curse, as it were, of spoken words. Now we need to understand this. Lucifer, Lucifer is not creative. He cannot create. He's not made in the image and likeness of God. None of the angels are made in the image and likeness of God. We are creative. Human beings are. We are made. In. He can only create with what you give him, Satan can. You know, we really need to understand this. Lucifer is not creative. Man is. And he relies on us to create for him. We supply the material. If he can inspire us to hateful words, to, to selfish words, to all of those kind of stuff, if he can inspire, inspire us to speak those th things out, he can create with them. He cannot create on his own. He requires the words of man to create. That's why either life or death is in your power. Either God can use it or Satan can use it. N Lucifer needs your words to create. There's no neutrality. You see? see Satan can manipulate creation, like the weather, the forces of nature, through the negative spoken words of man. Now, creation, the Bible tells us, is desperately wanting to get back to its original purpose, and that was to be servants to God's people. They were servants. It was a, the creation was a servant of Adam. Romans 8, 14, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For the earnest expectation of the cre creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. 
You see, creation wants to cooperate with us, serve us. You know, it says in Jesus, in Mark 4, and verse 39, it says, And he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are you so faithful? How is it that you have no faith? He just spoke, and the wind obeyed him. Every atom, every molecule rearranged themselves. And a great stillness came on the water. You see, creation has been under the control of Lucifer until God's people began to intervene and take their rightful place. Adam lost his dominion. We, in these last days, the sons of God, are going to take that same dominion back that Adam had. Creation needs to be redeemed and waits in expectation of the sons of God to arise. They want to become our servants. Romans 8 and verse 24, 22. For we know that the whole of creation groaneth and travails in pain together until now. Right up from the fall he's talking about into this present time. For the creature was made subject to vanity. The creation was made subject to vanity, Why? but not willingly. Adam did this when he gave it away. But by reason of him, Adam, who hath subjected the same, in hope, but there is hope, you see, for creation. It will change. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption unto the glorious liberty of the children of God. Creation was delivered over to Satan by man. In these last days, it's going to be redeemed back and brought under the dominion of man, the sons of God. We need this understanding to begin to rise up and take dominion over nature. This is very, very important. You know, with an understanding of this, God's words in our mouth can stop a hurricane in its tracks. It can stop the violence of nature. Nature wants to cooperate with us. There's exception to this when God uses nature to bring judgment. But apart from that exception, you see, nature wants to cooperate with us. And it's through our mouth that this happens. In Revelation 16, 21 says, There fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent, that's about a hundred pounds, and men blasphemed God. You say he used it for judgment. But outside of that, God wants us to take control back of this earth. It was lost by a man, it has to be regained by a man. It was regained by Jesus as a man. And now his sons finally have to rise up and take that position in him. Your words have consequences. Proverbs 6, 2, you are snared with the words of your mouth. You are taken with the words of your mouth. You know, I was called in to cancel someone a number of years ago, a woman who gave birth to a deformed child and, and she was, you know, crying out to God, asking why, why he had allowed this to happen. And, and, and she, I was called in to bring counsel to this woman and I was praying with her and I said, Lord, why did this happen? Why did you allow this to happen? The Lord took me back and I heard her speak these words. In fit of anger, when she became pregnant, she was so angry about becoming pregnant, out of her mouth came the words, I hope it is deformed when it's born. She was so angry. And I said, you said these words. And she eventually admitted to saying those words. Obviously, every deformed child that is born is not that reason, but in this case it was. What you say has consequences. You know, every rima, if it's in a demonic inspired or fallen nature inspired word, a rima word, a spirit inspired word, it will come to pass. That's why anger is so dangerous. You shall have what you say. 
Now in Hebrews 2 and verse 5 it says, For unto the angels he had not put in subjection the world to come whereof we speak, but in one, one in a place, certain place, testified, saying, What is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit us him? You made him a little lower than the angels, or Elohim, as we said before, and crowned him with glory and honor, and set him over the works of your, his hands, thy hands. And you put all things in subjection under his feet. So in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 6 through 9, we see now Paul is taking this further than even D David took it. It said, They set him over the works of your hand, and you put everything under his feet. Okay. It says, But now we see Jesus, who is made a little lower than the angel, Elohim, God, uh, for the suffering of death crowned him with glory and honor, that by grace of God should taste death for every man. Now the reason for this, the reason why Jesus did this, is in Hebrews 10, 12, 2 and verse 10, For it became him for whom are all things, and by whom in all things bring many sons to glory. The reason for this, Jesus was the first who went before us with this authority. The reason for this is so that he could bring, bring many sons after him into that same place, giving him, setting over the works of his hands, just the same authority that was given to Adam. You see? Then, in chapter 3, it starts out, verse 1, Wherefore, after saying all this, he says, Wherefore? So we need to know why the wherefore is therefore. So he says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, um, which the heavenly calling with sons of God, consider the apostle and priest of our pro profession, Christ Jesus. He is the high priest, it says, of our profession. That word profession is the Greek word for confession. And the Greek word, literally, literally, the Greek word is homologia, which means to say the same things that God has said to you. Whenever God speaks to us, we say the same thing. And it is His words in our mouth. When we are saying the same thing, when we speak his words in our mouth, he is the high priest. He takes it before the Father and says, Father, these are saying my words. They must be brought to pass. He is the high priest of our confession, high priest of the words that we speak when they are the same words that he is speaking through us. He takes them before the Father and says they must be brought to pass. This is an incredible thing, you see. God did not put angels, this world, into subjection to angels. He put it into man's subjection. Adam had it. And he set him over the works of his hands. And uh, eventually lost it. But Jesus came and won it back again. Now he has many sons, human beings, who will take it back from Satan again and take dominion over this earth, over this planet and everything in it. He will become the high priest of our words, and his words through our mouth will not return unto us void. They will be in the name of Jesus, and that simply means speaking the words with his permission. Let us pray. Father, we just thank you for these words today. We, we thank you for the reality, Lord, of this truth. I pray that it will come home to your people in such a way that they'll begin to now dedicate their mouths, consecrate their mouths unto you, that their words may be that which brings life and not death, that they might be disciplined in their words, so that when you grant them and when you give them delegated authority, they will be disciplined and only speak your words, Father, in their mouths. Lord, Cause them to see this and understand it. Help them to enter into it. Help them to discipline their lives to become a part of it. In time, sons of God, with great authority. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 
we are continuing with our series on the power of words or the power of speech. It is such an important subject that we really need to grasp this in all of its intensity so that we begin to understand that our words are so important. You know, words have power much greater than most Christians uh, understand. They can produce life or they can produce death. You know, psychologists and med medical doctors and philosophers are just starting to understand uh, the power of words. They've been studying it for many, many, many years, the effect that words have on various things, on other human beings, on animals, on plants, and so on. You know, the Apostle James gave some remarkable insight into the power of words. Let's just read what he said. In James chapter 3 and verse 2, it says, For we, we stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man and is able to bridle or control the whole body. You know, this is a remarkable portion of Scripture. It, it's like he was saying, you know, we mess up in many areas of our lives. But if we don't mess up on our speech, if we get this right, we are a perfect man. Able to control, bridle, able to control our whole body. You know, that perfect man, that same word is used in, in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 48. It says, therefore, you shall be perfect, just as your father... Uh, in heaven is perfect. That word perfect means has the meaning to complete your purpose on this earth. The reason you are here for. To complete it. To come to the end of it. To fulfill it. And um, it has two basic meanings. It means one, to fulfill our purpose being conformed to the image of Christ. And secondly, fulfilling your destiny, the reason for which you came here. Now, this is remarkable. Being conformed to the image of Jesus, becoming like him, and also fulfilling our destiny. He says, if we can control our tongue, if, I, if we, our speech is right, uh, these two things will happen. We'll eventually fulfill our destiny and we'll be conformed to the image of Jesus. And uh, it's a remarkable passage of Scripture. If we stumble, you know, we stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a person who will be conformed to the image of Jesus and now he will finish his course, his destiny here while on earth. And he goes on to say, and he is able to bridle his own whole body, to bridle his body, to rein in, to con control his whole body. You know, when we get angry, our body releases all kinds of chemicals into the blood. And these create chaos on the inside of us. Our stress levels rise, our, our blood pressure goes up, all kinds of other nasty things begin to happen to us. And so as the body begins internally to rage out of control, um, the damage, internal damage physically to us is enormous. You see, stress is killing millions of people across the face of the earth. Now, James said in James chapter 3 and verse 3, he said this, Behold, we put bits in horses' mouths, that they may listen, obey us, and we and turn their whole body. In other words, we can turn the whole body of a horse with a little small bit which is in their mouth. In other words, you can control that big horse by a tiny little bit in the mouth. Then it goes on in the first four, it says, Behold, also ships which though they be so great and are driven by fierce winds, yet they are turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. And so, he's saying a boat, he's using the analogy of a boat. You know, 
you can get a huge boat, a huge liner, and it is controlled, it is turned by a tiny rudder. There's a helm up in the control room and then a rudder at the back of the ship. But this it's this little rudder that steers that whole body, that huge ship. And um, it's amazing when you think of it. And James is saying this tongue will steer our whole life, our whole body, this whole ship here, you know. And so in James 3, 5, even so the tongue is a little member. Just like that rudder, it's a little member and boasts great things. And how great a matter a little fire kindleth. You see, it's not winds, currents and sails and winds that finally determine the ship's direction or where the ship ends up. It's the little rudder at the back. And that is so much of our life. You know... <laughs> The direction we go in, the direction of our lives, where we end up, how we fare, is not determined by circumstances. It's determined by this. It's determined by our tongue. Now, in James chapter 3 and verse 9, it says, Therewith we bless God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. And out of the same mouth proceeds blessings and cursings. My brethren, these things ought not to be. Does a fountain send forth at the same place sweet and bitter water? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives? Or a vine, figs? So can no fountain both yield salt and fresh water. The, see, the power to control your tongue, to direct your circumstances on your destiny, can never be understated. You know, our lives, where you end up, how we physically are in the long run, where you end up, whether you finish your course, is going to be determined by the words that you speak. Now think about it. The words that you speak. James is very clear in what he is saying here. You know, neurosurgeons have discovered that the speech center in the brain has direct control over our nervous system, the whole of our nervous system. But you know, King Solomon stated this thousands of years ago in Psalm 18 verse 21, life and death are in the power of the tongue. The neurosurgeons are just beginning to understand that. They've made the link between the speech center in the brain and its connection with our whole nervous system. You see, and it's like James said that the direction of our life is determined by that little rudder. The, di the direction of the ship, we are the ship, and it's determined by that little rudder, the tongue. And uh, the speech center in the brain has a direct effect on our whole nervous system. And it's, it's not just your words that have an effect over your nervous system. Your thoughts do as well. Because, you know, Proverbs 23, 7 says, For as a man thinketh in his heart, so he is. So as we think, so we are. All right, now just, just muse on that for a moment. You need to understand it. What you think affects you physically. It affects your whole system. It affects your no nervous system, your heart. It affects your lungs. It affects your skin. It affects everything in your physical body, the way you think. You see, and it's like, as you think, so you are. We must understand this, not just what you think, but it's also the emotions that you express, your desires, your words, all of these things affect us in a very profound way. Most Christians never even think about these things. They just go through their life as normal, but it's very important that we understand this as we come down to the end of the age. 
And God is requiring more of us. And if we're going to survive the days that lie ahead, we have to take control and discipline the way that we talk. You know, emotions, mind, words, desires emanate from us as a form of power, a sound, and a color. When you get that mixed together, it is very, very powerful. Remember, in one of the episodes, we talked about the scientists looking at the electron in an atom. You know, the electron or the particle was in a state of flux, you know, just like a wave, a state of flux, until the scientists looked at it. And when the scientists observed it, the effect of the mind, emotions, will, and speech of that scientist affected it and it changed into a particle, the building blocks of life. You know, the mood, the thinking, the desires of the scientist affected, and what he believed affected the particle, the ch codes, the change. You are made up of these particles. As you think, these things are changing within us all of the time. We are made of all of this stuff. Atoms, particles, electrons, all there. Scientists discovered that the electron in an atom that orbits the nucleus is not always there in particle form. It exists just like a wave or a cloud, like until somebody looks at it, somebody speaks to it, and somebody's emotions affects it. And when it's observed, it changes. It's profound. It responds to the whatever the person is emanating. The Bible tells us to think. You know, the Bible is very clear. It tells us to, to only think on certain things. It's, it, it gives us a filter for the mind. And there's good, good reasons for this. You think, oh, well, our thoughts are not that important. They critically important. That's where the strongholds in the person is. They're in the area of our mind and we are told to pull down those strongholds and everything that's not in line with the way God thinks. Okay, Philippians 4 and verse 8. Finally, he said, the last thing he wanted to say, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, Whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. See, he tells us very clearly, and he gives us a framework of where our thinking should be, and we're not to stray outside of that. If you think about the things that you think about during a day or during a week and compare them to this list that is required of us, you know, how far we stray from this, the, the, this filter, if you like, of the mind and how different we would all be if we thought like this in Philippians. The importance of it is extreme. People continue to destroy their lives by what they think, think, what they desire, what they feel, and what they speak. So now we, we see how, how vitally important this is. All day long we are affecting changes around us, changes in our destiny, changes physically to us. Psalm 34 and verse 13 says, Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking guile. Proverbs 12 and verse 18 says, There is that speaketh like the piercing of a sword. But now listen, but the tongue of the wise is health. The tongue of the wise is health. The person who uses his tongue wisely is going to be in good health. That's what the Bible says. Now it's God's word. The tongue of the wise brings health to us, you see. The way you speak affects your entire physical body. What you say. Everything responds to what you say. You're a creator. 
You have authority. You have dominion over every atom in your being. What you say is affected. That atom will respond to what you say, what you think, what you feel, what you desire, what you even believe. And it goes on to say in Proverbs 21, 23, He who saw keepeth his mouth and his tongue keeps his soul from trouble. You know, your soul is your mind, your emotions, your will. The same thing again. If you keep your mouth, it affects our mind, it affects our emotions. It affects the things that we do, our will. So we see this. We see how vitally important this is. That's why we, we are dealing with this subject. The area of the tongue. It's really important in the day and age in which you and I are living in today. You know, in the beginning, all that existed was something in something like a primordial soup, the stuff of creation. It was there in flux. It was there until God spoke until words affected it. When God said, let there be light, it formed, it changed. That's what we are talking about. We are made in the image and likeness of God. We are creators and we are creating around us all of the time. We never stop creating. We never stop giving orders to everything around us. And they'll respond and they will obey. You know, we're going to see some incredible creative miracles um, when God's people begin to understand who they are and how they can create and how the power of the spoken word, the power of feelings, you know, what you speak affects the very foundational particles of this world. I want you to talk to you for a few moments uh, about Dr. Masaru Emoto. He's Japanese, not a Christian, but he was born in Japan. Uh, he was a graduate of Yokohama um, University and uh, as a doctor of alternative medicine. medicine. And he began to experiment with water. And uh, he began to photograph crystals, frozen crystals, ice crystals, and the shapes and so on. And what he discovered was that whatever was spoken over those crystals affected the shape of the crystals. Now at first, he, he, he couldn't believe this. And uh, in the end, he published a book, Messages um, from Water 1 and 2, The Hidden Messages in Water. It's over 400,000 copies were sold worldwide. And uh, what he found out was that the proof that thoughts, feelings, mood, music affected the crystals in a radical way. And uh, by forming these crystals and then either playing music to them or pronouncing a blessing over them or pronouncing negative and, and curse or curse like words to them, the crystals formed according to the words. Now it's very, very interesting this. This man is, is not a professing Christian as you and I would understand. And uh, he probably has a new age leaning to him. But his study was, was, was amazing. And it shows us some things. When, when mus music from Mozart's symphony was played, the crystals formed, crystals formed in this, into this image. And this is very interesting. It shows that the life in these crystals responded to, to music and words. You know, when we realize that all things are held together by the life and power of Jesus, we see how that life responds to love, positive affirmation. 
So it tells us in, in Colossians 1.16, For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things. Listen, and by him all things consist or continue to exist. And uh, the Greek word therefore consists has the meaning to be held together. And so we see this beautiful crystal. Mozart's music was played while the ice was forming this crystal and this is what it turned out to be. They played a, another s song, secular song, um, to another crystal that was beginning to form in the ice and the song was called You Make Me Sick. It was played, and when the crystals formed, this was the crystal that formed. You know, it looks just like kind of vomit. It began to conform to the words that are of the music, and uh, it looks like vomit. You know, you shall have whatsoever you say, Jesus said. You know, and when a song like love and gratitude was played this is what the other crystal formed into it's absolutely beautiful you see this no wonder the psalmist said in Psalm 19 14 let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight O Lord you know finally when other crystals were formed they played heavy metal music this is the crystal it formed into. It looks like a vortex of total confusion. The scary thing is this. Almost 70% of your physical body is made up of water. What are we doing to our body? The words that we speak and sing and listen to have a profound effect on us. Jane, uh, it said that the... the the, the words of our mouth is just like a rudder. It turns, it guides the whole ship. King David said, Set a watch over my mouth, O Lord, in Psalm 141.3. Keep the door of my lips. And so he talked about his lips as being a door. And I, from that door all kinds of things flow. The world will change your world will change, you will change by what you speak, what you say, what you feel. You know, your self-image is very, very important. And you, it's important that you speak about who Christ is in you. Not so much who you are in Christ, but who Christ is in you. We have his nature. Paul said, I can do all things through Christ. He said, you know, and in the name of Jesus, we can do all things. With his permission, under his will, under his dominion, we can do all things. We are more than conquerors. It's time to consecrate our mouth. Let the words of our mouth, the meditation of my heart, be acceptable unto the Lord. And we have to surrender to a higher authority. You know, Romans 12, verse 1, I beseech you that you... Surrender your whole being to the Lord. To exercise authority, we have to be able to hear and discern what the Lord is saying. And then we are dealing with a series on the importance of the power of speech, the words that we speak and how they affect everything. And I mean everything around us is affected by them. And, you know, we need to grasp what has been said, we need to grasp by revelation. It's just not enough for me to impart information to you. There needs to be an impartation in such a way that revelation, God quickens it and so it becomes real to you, becomes a part of you, becomes a revelation to you. Because revelation carries with it faith and it also carries with it the ability for you to enter into the revelation. You see, knowledge will not do that. But revelation knowledge will. It gives you, it, it has these added qualities or elements to it 
which brings us to the place of being able to enter into it. And so we need to pray and, and, and that God will speak to us by revelation so that we have a, it an, has an impact upon us and it, it begins to, if, to change us and affect us. Now, we're going to deal with today the nature and the power of words, but particularly the nature. You know, human beings are very vocal creatures. And uh, generally speaking, they're not aware of what their words are doing. And, um, and so, <laughs> we're made that way. We are very vocal. We, generally speaking, most people in a day talk a lot. And we, as we said in the last session, the speech center in the brain has a direct influence on our nervous system, our physical body. And uh, the words that are coming out of our mouth all day long, our physical body is responding to them. The atoms, the molecules are all responding to the words that we speak. And so there's changes going on constantly because of the words that we're speaking, the mood that we are in, how we are feeling, the emotions, the desires that we have. And, uh, you know, when you say, I'm getting old, everything in your being, your physical being, begins to respond to that and starts to age. They take that as a command. They take that as a fact. And, uh, you know, and so, you know, when people retire, a lot of people retire, and they're retiring many er earlier these days, that they retire, they, they've left their job, and they slow down, and, uh, you know, it's like they die quickly. They start to deteriorate. You know, age is not a chronological thing. It is a state of mind. Many people, when they retire, they say, oh, right, that's it, they're retired, they're old now, they're getting old. It doesn't have to be that way. You talk yourself into it. You'll talk your body into it if you want to. You'll talk your, your mindset will have an effect on the way that, that you feel. And uh, your ner nervous system responds also to your imagination. You know, if you have particular ladies, you have been in the home at night, and you're on your own, and it's dark, and you hear a sound outside like someone is trying to open the door. What happens? Your imagination runs wild, right? Now, it's just an imagination, but your imagination begins to affect your physical body. Your heart rate begins to increase. Fear, which is a feeling um, it's almost an abstract thing, it's a feeling, starts to affect you physically. And uh, you begin to sweat. Your whole body is responding just to the way you're thinking and the feeling of fear. That's a remarkable thing. Scientists are still trying to understand this. What happens, you see, when you become afraid? What happens when your heartbeat uh, rises like that? Everything in this universe, as we said last time, is affected by words. And everything in your universe, you see, Jesus, everything the Bible says in this world is held together by the Lord Jesus Christ, who speaks his words keep it together. It's held together by his words. Your world, your physical world, your world around you, all around you, your associations and everything, your world around you is held together by your words. When it starts falling apart, you need to check your words. Very, very important. We are made in the image and likeness of God. This whole universe is held together by Christ. You know, and it's like Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3 bears this out when it says, Who being in the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding, listen, all things by his word. Upholding all things by the word of his power. Imagine that. Everything is held together. 
by his words. His words. If he was to speak chaos, chaos would go. It would be everywhere. If he was to speak, it, so it's held together by his words. Now, your world, because we made in his image and likeness, it says, upholding all things by the word of his power, his words were power. Your private world, this world of your physical body, the world around you is held together by the words that you speak, the desires that you have, the feelings and emotions that go with that. Think about it. It's really important that we understand this. Now, psychologists and linguists tell us that before we ever speak, we have a picture of what we want to describe in our imagination. This is really interesting, you know. You know, begins in the mind as a picture. You visualize what you want to communicate with words. Now, this might happen in a fraction of a second, you know. And, um, you know, sometimes our communication skills are lacking. Um, it's hard sometimes to communicate something that you've seen. And, uh, you know, it's like a painter. He, he's seen something, he has to reform that in his mind and then he has to try and create it while we try to create a picture with our words and, and or recreate that picture which we've already seen and uh, it's important, it might just, you might need being aware of the visual picture you're trying to communicate but it is there you know, the language of heaven is far different to our language here on earth I've been, the Lord's allowed me to be in heaven a number of times and, you know, people communicate very differently. They, you, they can communicate just with feelings. You know, they can communicate uh, just with thoughts, almost like telepathy. Uh, they can, if trying to describe something to you, they can put that picture into your mind so that you can see it. Don't ask me how this works, but it works. You know, visions and dreams, we have a touch of it here on this earth. In, in Numbers chapter 12 and verse 6 through to verse 8, it tells us this. Then he said, hear my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known to him in a vision, and I'll speak to him in dreams. Verse 7, my servant Moses is not so, because Moses, who is faithful in all my house, with him I will speak mouth to mouth, even apparently, and not in dark speeches. And he'll actually see the similitude of the Lord, and shall he behold. You see, it talks about visions, dreams, similitudes of the Lord. This is how, but on a much greater way, that communication works in heaven. Yeah, there's, a, there's a library in heaven and you can take out a book and read about some of the great men of God on earth. You don't just read words, you feel what they felt. And there is projected into you an image of what they were doing, where they went, how they handled it. It's a whole different realm of communication. And um, the language of heaven is very diverse and comprehensive. Our native tongue, our native language is very limited compared to the language of heaven. And uh, in, in heaven there's a language of feeling. Feeling is a language, you know? How many of you know it's really hard sometimes to convey in words the way that you're feeling? Because it's a feeling, but we need words to convey it. And sometimes we can feel what the other person is feeling. Let me just say something to you, see if we can, you can kind of grasp this. When you combine words with imagination and feelings, you transcend the natural realm into the realm, the fourth dimension. You see, because words emanate a power, a color, a sound. There are a force, creative force. Feelings operate, depending on what feelings, they operate a different color, different sound. Desires, the same. Words, the same. When these combine, 
they produce a powerful creative force. Now this is not new age, believe me. This is how it is. This is how it is in heaven. And this is how it is in the spirit realm when we speak, if we could only see it. And um, combining it. You see, before God ever created this world, it was in his heart. It was in his mind what he wanted. It was in, if you like, his imaginations. You know, because it's in our heart before we speak it. In Matthew chapter 12, 34, O generation of vipers, now how can ye, being evil, speak good things? Then he said this, For out of the abundance of the heart, the realm of the heart, the unseen realm, the imaginary realm, the unseen realm, out of the abundance of the heart, your mouth will speak. It's in the heart first. It's in the form of pictures. It's in the form of imagination before you speak it out. It begins in the mind as a picture. You visualize what you want to communicate. Now, what we need to understand is the unimaginable creative power that we human beings have but don't appreciate it. We're not aware of it. Because we cannot see, unless your eyes are open to the realm of the Spirit, which the Lord allowed mine to be for a period of time, to see how this thing worked. And, you know, words are vibration. They have power. And when we combine them with imagination, feeling, and strong desire, the mix is so creative. It, it, it is unbelievable. And a threefold cord, you see, is not easily broken. When these things begin to come together. See, words, is, words are powerful, but when you mix them with, with um, emotion, their power is increased. When you mix, mix them with feeling and strong desire, the magnitude of that becomes much, much greater. God said to Abraham, you know, in Genesis 13 and verse 14, And the Lord said to Abraham after that lot was separated from him, He said, Lift up now your eyes and look from the place where you are northward and southward and eastward and westward. Then he said this, For all the land which you see, to you I will give it and to your seed forever. Now, he promised him to give him all of the land that he could see. Now, he couldn't see all of the land that God had promised to him from that vantage point. He couldn't see him with his physical eyes. So he was talking with more than just the physical eyes. The land that God promised them was a huge area you could never see. It's over the horizon that he said, I'll give you all the land that you can see. And uh, you see, we can only go as far as we can see. We can only go as far as we can, we understand by revelation. Then we can go that far. It's just not knowledge. It's revelation. Real unfolding of the, um, of the Holy Spirit giving us understanding in such a way. Only then can we go to that point. Now, when God promised Abraham that his seed would, would be, you know... As, as many as the stars in heaven. So, you know, Abraham had trouble visualizing his seed, you know. He had sons and daughters and this thing, but he, his seed would be that many people. How could he visualize all of that? So God says, look, I, I, I'll give you, I'll help you with this. He said in, in Genesis 15, 5, and he brought him forth abroad that was outside and said, now look towards the heavens and tell me the stars. Are you able to number them? And he said, so shall your seed be. He said, you visualize all of the stars as children. You say, oh, that's new age. No, it's new covenant. It's also the old covenant too. You can only speak what you have first in your heart, what you can see. Now, he said, all right. So every time when Abraham sat out at night outside his tent, the stars were spread above him. He used to th would think, my children, that's how many they're going to be. That was a very powerful creative force. 
the image, the vision, the image of the heart, of visualization. That was very, very important. He said, I'll give you all you can see the land. This is how many children we had. Look at the stars, keep looking at them, because that's how many it's going to be. You see, the fourth in the fourth dimension uh, language, vision is needed. And uh, same with the language of feeling. It transcends the physical. It moves us over into the fourth dimension. What is feeling? It's an intangible thing. It, 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 it's in the fourth dimension. It's not in this physical world in which we live. It's another dimension. It's in one spirit, you see. And it, it, it transcends the physical and moves over into the dimension of God. Listen, in Matthew 14, in verse 14, it says, And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude, and was moved with compassion towards them, and he healed their sick. What's compassion? He said, he was moved with compassion, and then healed the sick. See, compassion is a feeling. The strong feeling took hold of him. That combined with his word that he spoke, heal the sick. Mark, Mark 1 and verse 41, and Jesus, Jesus moved with compassion, put his, forth his hand and touched him and said unto him, I will, talking to the leper, he said, be clean. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy departed from him, and he was cleansed. You know, First he was moved with compassion. That's strong feeling, coupled with a strong desire to do something about this problem. Compassion. Connected with his word which he spoke, I will be thou clean. Those, just those two together created a tremendous force. You know, desire, a spoken word, feeling compassion, a threefold cord's not easily broken. And, uh, you know, combining the three different sounds that came in the unseen realm, three different smells, three different colors, all these things combining. The creative thing in the spirit world, the creative language began to flow from him. You know, in working with angels, in healing, compassion is needed before they can work with us. Vision is, is used to describe what you want done. And the words you speak brings it together. Okay? In healing, compassion is necessary. Compassion is needed to, to, to lock in onto the angels, who, the angels of healing, who will, who will release the flow and power with you. Vision is, is necessary. You need to see in your heart what you want to impart to them. What to see the healing that's needed for them. See it and speak it. Compassion, seeing, speaking, that threefold chord. When it comes together, you know, in John 6, 63, he said, It is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profited nothing. The words that I speak, he said, are not just ordinary words. They are spirit and they are life. In John chapter 7 and verse 46, it says, The, the officers answered, Never a man spoke like this. You see, Jesus had words. He had weight behind his words. Neurosurgeons have sought for years to try and understand what imagination is. It's not just memory. It draws on, that can draw from the past, but you can create your own world in your imagination. You can go in your imagination anywhere. It is a hot process, you know? That's why, you know, when God was creating this world, you know, the Bible says, in, in, in Isaiah 55, in verse 11, he said, So shall my word that goes forth out of my mouth, it shall not return unto me void. He used the word void. And it shall accomplish whatever I send it to. All right, the same word is used in Genesis chapter 1, when the soup of creation was just there. 
brooding over the earth. And, and you know, it was just there. The earth was without form and void. It's the word void. And he spoke. He said, let there be light. And it all changed. Creation started. Something began to happen. And it says like, you know, God's word, when he speaks a word, out of the nothingness comes something. And he said, it will not return back to that nothingness. It will accomplish to what I've sent it to. And it was the same, you know, with, with Mary, when the angel came to Mary and said she was going to be with child and bring forth Jesus. She said, how can this bring thee? How can this be so? And the angel of the Lord answered, the Holy Ghost will come upon you. In Luke 1 35, and the power of the highest shall overshadow you. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born in you shall be called the Son of God. You know, it's very interesting language. This it says, you know, it shall overshadow you. The Greek word for this word is to overshadow. It is is uh, it, it's a long Greek word. I won't try and try and speak it out to you but it means to envelop in a brilliant haze haze of brilliance you know and it was like the Holy Spirit brooded over the waters in the beginning and God spoke a word into that and as the Holy Spirit brooded over Mary she finally said these words be it unto me according to your word and the thing happened this is the process, you see, of creation. She brewed and Mary said, you know, uh, Behold the handmaiden of the Lord, be it unto me according to your words. First there was a void of nothingness, just possibilities. The Holy Spirit was brooding, the words were spoken, and change took place. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be the right words, O Lord. The Holy Spirit is always brooding. He is always overshadowing. You know, it's like in Acts chapter 5, 15, it says, Inasmuch as they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, that at least the shadow of Peter passing might overshadow them. It's the same word, to a haze of brilliant light. The Holy Spirit, it's the same word. It doesn't tell us how Peter prayed. But wherever he went, there was this Holy Spirit brooding. This, this haze of brilliant light was with him. And when he spoke, it would form. It does, doesn't tell us how Peter prayed, as I said. But, you know, Jesus had said to them, These signs shall follow them that believe in my name. And he told them, They shall heal the sick, cast out demons, and do all of those things. Take up serpents. Now, the word of God in our mouth is so powerful the Holy Spirit came the Spirit of God came to Abraham and gave him a word and it says by faith he was he went out and followed that word and in Romans 4 and verse 18 it says who it's talking about Abraham who against hope believed that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken to him so shall thy seed be. And not being weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead, when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. And he staggered and not, you see, at the promises. Every night he sat outside, he says, my children, as far as he could see in his heart, he knew that God was going to give that to him. That's the way it works. That's the nature of words. That's the power of words. That's the kind of person and power and influence that you have. It's really, really important. You use it aright. And you only use it. You only use it when you have the word of the Lord in your mouth. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again. Thank you for your goodness, your blessings. We thank you, Lord, for your word. I pray that it will find a place within the hearts of your people, that it might begin to turn them around, causing them to understand who they are in your image and likeness, causing them to understand the responsibility they have to order their words aright. 
Bring it home, Lord, by the power and revelation of your Spirit to their hearts, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. We are dealing with this series on the importance of the power of speech, the words that we speak, and how they affect everything. And I mean everything around us is affected by them. And, you know, we need to grasp what has been said. We need to grasp by revelation. It's just not enough for me to impart information to you. There needs to be an impartation in such a way that revelation, God quickens it and so it becomes real to you, becomes a part of you, becomes a revelation to you. Because revelation carries with it faith and it also carries with it the ability for you to enter into the revelation. You see, knowledge will not do that. But revelation knowledge will, it gives you, it, it has these added qualities or elements to it, which brings us to the place of being able to enter into it. And so we need to pray and, and, and that God will speak to us by revelation so that we have a, it has an impact upon us and it, it begins to, to change us and affect us. Now, we're going to deal with today the nature and the power of words, but particularly the nature. You know, human beings are very vocal creatures. And uh, generally speaking, they're not aware of what their words are doing. And, um, and so, <laughs> we're made that way. We are very vocal. We, generally speaking, most people in a day talk a lot. And we, as we said in the last session, the speech center in the brain has a direct influence on our nervous system, our physical body. And uh, the words that are coming out of our mouth all day long, our physical body is responding to them. The atoms, the molecules are all responding to the words that we speak. And so there's changes going on constantly because of the words that we're speaking, the mood that we are in, how we are feeling, the emotions, the desires that we have. And, uh, you know, when you say, I'm getting old, everything in your being, your physical being, begins to respond to that and starts to age. They take that as a command. They take that as a fact. And, uh, you know, and so, you know, when people retire, a lot of people retire, and they're retiring many er earlier these days, that they retire, they, they've left their job, and they slow down, and, uh, you know, it's like they die quickly. They start to deteriorate. You know, age is not a chronological thing. It is a state of mind. Many people, when they retire, they say, oh, right, that's it, they're retired, they're old now, they're getting old. It doesn't have to be that way. You talk yourself into it. You'll talk your body into it if you want to. You'll talk your, your mindset will have an effect on the way that, that you feel. And uh, your ner nervous system responds also to your imagination. You know, if you have particular ladies, you've been in home at night, and you're on your own, and it's dark, and you hear a sound outside like someone is trying to open the door. What happens? Your imagination runs wild, right? Now, it's just an imagination, but your imagination begins to affect your physical body. Your heart rate begins to increase. Fear, which is a feeling um, it's almost an abstract thing, it's a feeling, starts to affect you physically. And uh, you begin to sweat. Your whole body is responding just to the way you're thinking and the feeling of fear. That's a remarkable thing. Scientists are still trying to understand this. What happens, you see, when you become afraid? What happens when your heartbeat uh, rises like that? Everything in this universe, as we said last time, is affected by words. 
and everything in your universe. You see, Jesus, everything the Bible says in this world is held together by the Lord Jesus Christ, whose, whose words keep it together. It's held together by his words. Your world, your physical world, your world around you, all around you, your associations and everything, your world around you is held together by your words. When it starts falling apart, you need to check your words. Very, very important. We are made in the image and likeness of God. This whole universe is held together by Christ. You know, and it's like Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3 bears this out when it says, Who being in the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding, listen, all things by his word. Upholding all things by the word of his power. Imagine that. Everything is held together by his words. His words. If he was to speak chaos, chaos would go. It would be everywhere. If he was to speak, it, so it's held together by his words. Now, your world, because we made in his image and likeness, it says, upholding all things by the word of his power, his words were power. Your private world, this world of your physical body, the world around you is held together by the words that you speak, the desires that you have, the feelings and emotions that go with that. Think about it. It's really important that we understand this. Now, psychologists and linguists tell us that before we ever speak, we have a picture of what we want to describe in our imagination. This is really interesting, you know. You know, begins in the mind as a picture. You visualize what you want to communicate with words. Now, this might happen in a fraction of a second, you know. And, um, you know, sometimes our communication skills are lacking. Um, it's hard sometimes to communicate something that you've seen. And, uh, you know, it's like a painter. He, he's seen something, he has to reform that in his mind, and then he has to try and create it. While we try to create a picture with our words, and, and or recreate that picture which we've already seen. And uh, it's important. It might just, you might need to be aware of the visual picture you're trying to communicate, but it is there. You know, the language of heaven is far different to our language here on earth. I've been, the Lord's allowed me to be in heaven a number of times, and, you know, people communicate very differently. They, you, they can communicate just with feelings. You know, they can communicate uh, just with thoughts, almost like telepathy. Uh, they can, if trying to describe something to you, they can put that picture into your mind so that you can see it. Don't ask me how this works, but it works. You know, visions and dreams, we have a touch of it here on this earth. In, in Numbers chapter 12 and verse 6 through to verse 8, it tells us this. Then he said, hear my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known to him in a vision, and I'll speak to him in dreams. Verse 7, my servant Moses is not so, because Moses, who is faithful in all my house, with him I will speak mouth to mouth, even apparently, and not in dark speeches. And he'll actually see the similitude of the Lord, and shall he behold. You see, it talks about visions, dreams, similitudes of the Lord. This is how, but on a much greater way, that communication works in heaven. Yeah, there's, a, there's a library in heaven, and you can take out a book and read about some of the great men of God on earth. You don't just read words. You feel what they felt. And there is projected into you an image of what they were doing, where they went, how they handled it. It's a whole different realm of communication. And um, 
the language of heaven is very diverse and comprehensive. A native tongue, a native language is very limited compared to the language of heaven. And uh, in, in heaven there's a language of feeling. Feeling is a language. You know? How many of you know it's really hard sometimes to convey in words the way that you're feeling? Because it's a feeling. But we need words to convey it. And sometimes we can feel what the other person is feeling. Let me just say something to you. See if we can, you can kind of grasp this. When you combine words with imagination and feelings, you transcend the natural realm into the realm, the fourth dimension. You see, because words emanate a power, a color, a sound. There are a force, creative force. Feelings operate, a, depending on what feelings they are, operate a different color, different sound. Desires, the same. Words, the same. When these combine, they produce a powerful creative force. Now this is not New Age, believe me. This is how it is. This is how it is in heaven. And this is how it is in the spirit realm when we speak, if we could only see it. And um, combining it. You see, before God ever created this world, it was in his heart. It was in his mind what he wanted. It was in, if you like, his imaginations. You know, because it's in our heart before we speak it. In Matthew chapter 12, 34, O generation of vipers, now how can ye, being evil, speak good things? Then he said this, For out of the abundance of the heart, the realm of the heart, the unseen realm, the imaginary realm, the unseen realm, out of the abundance of the heart, your mouth will speak. It's in the heart first. It's in the form of pictures. It's in the form of imagination before you speak it out it begins in the mind as a picture you visualize what you want to communicate now what we need to understand is the unimaginable creative power that we human beings have but don't appreciate it we don't not aware of it because we cannot see, unless your eyes are open to the realm of the Spirit, which the Lord allowed mine to be for a period of time, to see how this thing worked. And, you know, words are vibration. They have power. And when we combine them with imagination, feeling, and strong desire, the mix is so creative. It, it, it is unbelievable. And a threefold chord, you see, is not easily broken. When these things begin to come together. See, words, is, words are powerful, but when you mix them with, with um, emotion, their power is increased. When you mix, mix them with feeling and strong desire, the magnitude of that becomes much, much greater. God said to Abraham, you know, in Genesis 13 and verse 14, And the Lord said to Abraham, after that lot was separated from him, He said, Lift up now your eyes and look from the place where you are northward and southward and eastward and westward. Then he said this, For all the land which you see, to you I will give it and to your seed forever. Now, he promised him, to give him all of the land that he could see. Now he couldn't see all of the land that God had promised to him from that vantage point. He couldn't see him with his physical eyes. So he was talking with more than just the physical eyes. The land that God promised them was a huge area you could never see. It's over the horizon that he said, I'll give you all the land that you can see. And uh, you see, we can only go as far as we can see. We can only go as far as we can, we understand by revelation. Then we can go that far. It's just not knowledge. It's revelation. Real unfolding of the, um, of the Holy Spirit giving us understanding in such a way. Only then can we go to that point. Now, when God promised Abraham that his seed would, would be, you know, 
as, as many as the stars in heaven. So, you know, Abraham had trouble visualizing his seed, you know. He had sons and daughters and things, but he, his seed would be that many people. How could he visualize all of that? So God says, look, I, I, I'll give you, I'll help you with this. He said in, in Genesis 15, 5, and he brought him forth abroad that was outside and said, now look towards the heavens and tell me the stars. Are you able to number them? And he said, so shall your seed be. He said, you visualize all of the stars as children. You say, oh, that's new age. No, it's new covenant. It's also the old covenant too. You can only speak what you have first in your heart, what you can see. Now, he said, all right. So every time when Abraham sat out at night outside his tent, the stars were spread above him. He used to th would think, my children, that's how many they're going to be. That was a very powerful creative force. The image, the vision, the image of the heart, of visualization, <laughs> that was very, very important. He said, I'll give you all you can see the land. This is how many children we had. Look at the stars. Keep looking at them because that's how many it's going to be. You see, the fourth in the fourth dimension uh, language, vision is needed. And uh, same with the language of feeling. It transcends the physical. It moves us over into the fourth dimension. What is feeling? It's an intangible thing. It, 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 it's in the fourth dimension. It's not in this physical world in which we live. It's another dimension. It's in one spirit, you see. And it, it, it transcends the physical and moves over into the dimension of God. Listen, in Matthew 14, in verse 14, it says, And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion towards them, and he healed their sick. What's compassion? He said he was moved with compassion and then healed the sick. See, compassion is a feeling. The strong feeling took hold of him. That combined with his word that he spoke, heal the sick. Mark, Mark 1 and verse 41, and Jesus, Jesus moved with compassion, put his, forth his hand and touched him and said unto him, I will, talking to the leper, he said, be clean. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy departed from him and he was cleansed. You know, first he was moved with compassion. That's strong feeling, coupled with a strong desire to do something about this problem. Compassion. Connected with his word which he spoke, I will be thou clean. Those, just those two together created a tremendous force. You know, desire, a spoken word, feeling compassion, a threefold cord's not easily broken. And... Uh, you know, combining the three different sounds that came in the unseen realm, three different smells, three different colors, all these things combining. The creative thing in the spirit world, the creative language began to flow from him. You know, in working with angels in healing, compassion is needed before they can work with us. Vision is, is used to describe what you want done. And the words you speak brings it together. Okay? In healing, compassion is necessary. Compassion is needed to, to, to lock in onto the angels, who, the angels of healing, who will, who will release the flow and power with you. Vision is, is necessary. You need to see in your heart what you want to impart to them. What to see the healing that's needed for them. See it and speak it. Compassion, seeing, speaking, that threefold chord. When it comes together, you know, in John 6, 63, he said, it is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak, he said, are not just ordinary words. They are spirit and they are life. 
in John chapter 7 and verse 46, it says, the, the officers answered, never a man spoke like this. You see, Jesus had words. He had weight behind his words. Neurosurgeons have sought for years to try and understand what imagination is. It's not just memory. It draws on, that can draw from the past, but you can create your own world in your imagination. You can go in your imagination anywhere. It is a hot process, you know? That's why, you know, when God was creating this world, you know, the Bible says, in, in, in Isaiah 55, in verse 11, he said, so shall my word that goes forth out of my mouth, it shall not return unto me void. Use the word void. And it shall accomplish whatever I send it to. All right. The same word is used in Genesis chapter 1, when the soup of creation was just there, brooding over the earth. And, and you know, it was just there. The earth was without form and void. It's the word void. And he spoke. He said, let there be light. And it all changed. Creation started. Something began to happen. And it says like, you know, God's word, when he speaks a word, out of the nothingness comes something. And he said, it will not return back to that nothingness. It will accomplish to what I've sent it to. And it was the same, you know, with, with Mary, when the angel came to Mary and said she was going to be with child and bring forth Jesus. She said, how can this bring thee? How can this be so? It, and the angel of the Lord answered, the Holy Ghost will come upon you. In Luke 1 35, and the power of the highest shall overshadow you. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born in you shall be called the Son of God. You know, it's very interesting language. It's, it says, you know, it shall overshadow you. The Greek word for this word is to overshadow. It is, is, uh, it's a long Greek word. I won't try and try and speak it out to you, but it means to envelop in a brilliant haze, haze of brilliance. You know, and it was like the Holy Spirit brooded over the waters in the beginning, and God spoke a word into that. And as the Holy Spirit brooded over Mary, she finally said these words: "Be it unto me according to your word." And the thing happened. This is the process, you see, of creation. She brewed and Mary said, you know, uh, Behold the handmaiden of the Lord, be it unto me according to your words. First there was a void of nothingness, just possibilities. The Holy Spirit was brooding. The words were spoken and change took place. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be the right words, O oh Lord. The Holy Spirit is always brooding. He is always overshadowing. You know, it's like in Acts chapter 5, 15, it says, Inasmuch as they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, that at least the shadow of Peter passing might overshadow them. It's the same word, to a haze of brilliant light. The Holy Spirit, it's the same word. It doesn't tell us how Peter prayed. But wherever he went, there was this Holy Spirit brooding. This, this haze of brilliant light was with him. And when he spoke, it would form. It does, doesn't tell us how Peter prayed, as I said. But, you know, Jesus had said to them, These signs shall follow them that believe in my name. And he told them, They shall heal the sick, cast out demons, and do all of those things. Take up serpents. Now, the word of God in our mouth is so powerful. The Holy Spirit came, the Spirit of God came to Abraham and gave him a word. And it says, by faith, he, was, he went out and followed that word. And in Romans 4 and verse 18, it says, who, it's talking about Abraham, who against hope believed that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken to him. So shall thy seed be. 
and not being weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead, when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. And he staggered and not, you see, at the promises. Every night he sat outside, he says, my children, as far as he could see in his heart, he knew that God was going to give that to him. That's the way it works. That's the nature of words. That's the power of words. That's the kind of person and power and influence that you have. It is really, really important. You use it aright. And you only use it. You only use it when you have the word of the Lord in your mouth. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again. Thank you for your goodness, your blessings. We thank you, Lord, for your word. I pray that it will find a place within the hearts of your people, that it might begin to turn them around, causing them to understand who they are in your image and likeness, causing them to understand the responsibility they have to order their words aright. Bring it home, Lord, by the power and revelation of your spirit to their hearts, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. We are dealing with the subject of words, our speech, and how that it affects everything around us. We saw how that it affects the little, a tongue, James said, that our tongue is like a rudder. It determines where the ship ends up. It determines in what course, what direction the ship, this, the ship sails in. It's the same with our lives. Our lives is like that ship. And it controls our world. And so this is the importance of the subject in which we're dealing with. And today we're going to deal with a little bit more about the tongue and our destiny and uh, how it shapes our destiny. And, you know, this generation has been given destinies like no other generation on the face of the earth. Now I know that might be quite a statement to make, but it's true. Many things in God have been reserved just for your, our generation, this generation. You know, lost inheritances have been piling up for generations and generations and generations. People who didn't fulfill their destinies and so their core wasn't fulfilled and so it comes across that it's there for someone else um, to pick up and become part of their core. And, uh, you know, destinies, inheritances that have been stolen, people who have died for whatever reason not fulfilled it. There are mantles that, that men of God have left behind and women of God have left behind and some of them have been taken captive by the enemy and kept in the second heaven and, and, and some of them are just still there waiting for others to pick them up. And uh, there are mantles that rested powerfully upon godly people, godly saints of the past and have not been taken up by anyone else. We're living in a time now when many of the saints, the, the ministries from the 1948 move will be taken home. People like Billy Graham and Al Roberts and T.L. Osborne. Their mantles will remain and their mantles will become powerful to those who are able to have them assigned to them and picked up and to run with them. They'll become much, 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 seven, at least seven times more powerful than the men it rested upon. But they're held there. There are places, you know, in heaven where provision is stored for this generation. Huge amounts of provision. And... Um, there are spare parts, you know, spare body parts uh, for creative miracles. There are uh, models of buildings that need to be built in the, over the next few years. There's a room in heaven where all of these buildings are. They're like scale models of being built by the angels that, that are to be built here. Um, and all of these things have been reserved for this generation. And, you know, I saw inventions which had been put together and made and are waiting to be picked up. 
reserved, you see, for this generation, reserved for the day and age in which you and I um, are living in. And it says in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3 through to verse 5, it says, Blessed be uh, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So there are spiritual blessings in heavenly places reserved, settled for us there. Verse 4, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. That's destiny. That we should be holy and without him and blame before him in love. So he chose us before the foundation of the world. Having, in verse 5, predestinated us, first chosen, then predestinated unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will. And so we have a generation here. We have all this stuff in heavenly places. These blessings in heavenly places. Blessed us with all that we need is reserved for us in heavenly places. Now think about that. Everything that you and I need to fulfill our destinies is held somewhere in heavenly places for us, this generation, to pick up. This generation is very special and many things have been reserved just for this generation. And so, in 1 Peter 1 and verse 3, it goes on to say, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us unto a lively hope, there's a hope there, by the resurrection of the dead, to an inheritance, incorruptible and defiled and faded not away, reserved in heaven for us. And see, and why are you for this generation? Who are kept by the power of God through faith, ready to be revealed in the last times. Ready to reveal that we're living in the last times. All this stuff and inheritance, blessed, abundant blessing, reserved in heaven for us, or in heavenly places for us, this generation, for us to be released or to be revealed in these end times. Now think about it. Destiny, elect according, an inheritance reserved for us in the end times. You see, all that we need to fulfill our destiny has been reserved for us. It already exists. The finance that we need, the giftings we need, the abilities that we need, the, the uh, context that we need to have, all of that's been arranged for this generation. We're living in the day, you know, of the acceleration of time. Everything we know around us has been accelerated. T time is an earthly concept. You know, in the realm of the spirit, there is no such thing as time. It doesn't exist there. Time is an earthly reality. And, uh, but, you know, we're reaching a point. I'm not sure how this works, but things are moving much, much faster. Everything is in a state of acceleration. And, uh, you know, this phenomena is both in the natural and in the spiritual. In regard to the coming harvest, it tells us this in Amos 9, 13, Behold, the day shall come, saith the Lord, that the plowman shall overtake the reaper, and the treader of grapes, him that soweth seed. Ah, the treader of grapes, him that soweth seed, and the mountains shall drop sweet wine, and all the hills shall melt. Okay, this exponential acceleration is needed in order to reap the harvest. There's a, time is very short. There's a huge harvest to be reaped. But he said, things will speed up so quickly, the plowman shall overtake the reaper. That's the, in other words, there'll be continuing harvest coming in all of the time. And, uh, you know, how does this affect our lives today? How does this impinge on our daily lives? How, how should we be responding to this? We know computers have sped up most things in our lives, you know, and the acceleration and advancement in all fields of science is due in part to computers. But it's the same in the realm of the spirit. Things are moving much quicker. 
the concept of sowing and reaping is the turnaround in sowing and reaping is much, much speeded up. It's coming much quicker. And, um, you know, Daniel 12 and verse 4, it says, Daniel, shut the words and seal the book even to the end of the time, end, the time of the end. And many shall run to and fro. Knowledge shall increase. You know, many shall run to and fro. To, to, to travel from England to Australia a hundred years ago took about eight to nine months. Now it takes a matter of just a matter of hours. It says knowledge shall increase. Well, we understand that today. Everything is happening more quickly. But the problem is, you see, for the average Christian, life goes on as usual. And this is a major problem for Christians today. You know, Jesus said, was as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be like in our days. They, they married, they gave in marriage, they ate and they drank, and they did all of the normal thing, but didn't really know that the flood was right upon them. It's like a bit like that today. We continue with our lives like nothing is going to change. But Jesus is coming very soon. You know, we're heading into days of great tribulation and Jesus is coming. We're on at the end of time. And so much has been reserved for this generation. That's what we've been reading. You know, time is running out fast and we need an ark. As it was in the days of Noah. You see, Noah built an ark. And they rode through the storm of those days. God didn't deliver them from the storm. They rode through it and rode over that storm. And we need an ark to live in, an ark to survive the coming days. You know, the Bible says, He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High God, in Psalm 91, will not be afraid of what is coming. We have passed the point now where it's business as usual. We're on a countdown to the end, and the finishing line is in sight. You know, a little while ago, the Lord spoke to me in a vision and he said, you are now entering a time when you will not be able to walk with me unless you have a constant connection with me. And he said, long periods of existing without my presence will cause you to fall off the pathway in such a way that it will be very difficult for you to get back on. You know, it talks about a pathway in Proverbs 4, 18, but the path of the just is as a shining light that shines more and more. And to that perfect day and uh, acceleration of our times, it's like a chain reaction. And uh, it's, we fall out of timing with the Lord if we don't keep up. And then we kind of fall off the track because we're not up with what God is doing and saying anymore. And we fall out of timing with Him. And, uh, you know, in Jeremiah 12, 5, it tells us, If you have run with the footmen and they have wearied you, how can you contend with horses? How can you run with horses? And if in the land of peace where you trusted, they got you down or they wearied you, how will you do when the swelling of Jordan? Drifting through another year will cause you to be out of timing with God. You see? Out of timing. Jesus said to the, to the people around him in his day in Luke 9, 44, it says, And they shall lay thee even to the ground and your children within you. And he said, There will not be one stone upon another left in the temple. But they, they just could not grasp it. They could not keep up with it. They were out of timing with it. And all of this happened. And we are the last generation on the face of the earth before the return of Jesus. There's no doubt about it. Time is very short. Very, very short. Oh. Your destiny is important. And it has to be fulfilled in the time that we have got left. We are running out of time. You know, in Revelation 10, 5, an angel, or 10, 6, it says, an angel, it says, stood on the earth, one foot in the sea, one foot in the land, and he said, time shall be no more. You see, we are running out of, the t out of time. And, uh, you know, during these next seven years, all of the aspects 
of the Feast of Tabernacles will unfold. All of those truths, all of those aspects will unfold. Joseph Ministries will arrive. The revival will become perpetual. And uh, in the light of all of this, what should we be doing? How should we respond to this? How can we take hold of this provision? See, you need to know what your calling and purpose is. You really need to know what your destiny is in this hour. And you need to know how to call it forth. You, you, you really got to spend time seeking God, finding out what your destiny is, finding out what His purposes for you over these next few years are. It's critical now, therefore, this, that you understand this. Otherwise, you'll fall out of timing, you'll just drift through the next 12 months, nothing will change. You have to know, you have to know how to call it forth. You have to know, if you like, how to incubate that thing, how to bring it forth. And it's like, you know, the Holy Spirit brooded, the Bible says, brooded. And that word is used for, for a, a hen brooding over an egg, you know, and, and the egg hatches. But there's a time, you know, of brooding. And, and that's what the Bible tells us about, this brooding time. We're in it right now, but you cannot, you see, hatch. You cannot bring forth your destiny unless you know what it is. Most prayers, Christians' prayers, are not answered simply because they're not specific enough. They cannot be answered because they're too airy-fairy. They're not specific your destiny is not something that, it has to be something that is specific. You need to know what you are called to, where you are heading, and consistency is needed, discipline is needed. You need to take care, you take control of your time, redeeming the time, because the Bible says the days are evil. Now once you know, once you seek God, you get before Him, you know what your purpose is, then you need to brood on that. You need, the Holy Spirit is there. You need to visualize it. You need to see it. You need to have the picture in your mind. You need to have the feel in your emotions of that thing. You need to have a strong desire for it. You need to speak words that will draw it, bring it to pass. And you need to hold your words in, in, in that focus so that this thing will really come to pass. You need to incubate it, as it were, you know, those, those things have to be incubated. These are the days, this is the age in which you and I are living. And everything rests in the power, what is coming out of your mouth, has to be God's words. Your destiny has to be known by you, and then it has to be spoken, it has to be seen in your heart. It has to be spoken by your mouth. It has to be felt in your emotions. And all of that releases, it just starts to release into the realm of the Spirit. Power. These threefold chord comes together. That power is released. And, and it begins to form your destiny. It begins to rearrange the right contacts, the people you need to connect with. It needs to, and it begins to form, it begins to pull everything in. It begins to release the resources that are laid up for you, this generation, that are laid up in the second heaven, laid up there, or taken captive in the second heaven, to be brought out to you. Laid up in heaven for you. There are mantles you need to pick up to fulfill your destiny. But until you know what your destiny is, you cannot speak it forth. You cannot speak it into being. You see, God wants to give us real authority, great authority. But we need to know how to use it. And it's like your destiny, your world, you know, that bit in the horse's mouth, controlled that horse, that powerful horse, controlled its direction and where it would end up. And that bit in your mouth, you see, is what you think, is what you feel, and is what you speak, which will control the forming of your destiny, which will steer you into that which God is purposing for you in this hour. But you see, you really 
I have to come before the Lord to understand what your destiny is. You see, so many people come in and say, you know, tell me, what is, what is God calling me to? I say, well, have you fasted? Have you prayed? Have you sought God? Oh, no. Well, I can't tell you that. Or I won't tell you that. Because you need to seek, you need to knock, you need to ask. And you need to put some time fasting aside. Pray, seek the Lord. Time is short. You really need to know what you're supposed to be doing over the next few years. The next seven years will unfold before us. And after that, it's going to become very, very, very difficult on this planet. And we need to, by that stage, be walking in authority. The secret place of the Most High, you see, is the holiest of all. It's walking with the Lord in spirit, in that dimension of the Lord, knowing the Lord. And as these things unfold on the earth, terrible things, it says, only with your eyes shall you behold the reward of the wicked, but it shall not come near you. Only you can abide in the secret place of the Most High. Only you can live there in connection with the Lord. It simply means connected. Connected to the Lord in your spirit. Walking with him in spirit. Knowing and hearing his voice. You see, seek, knock, ask, press. Don't be denied. Press into the presence of God. These are days when you need to know and understand what we've been teaching in this series. The importance of your words. But you cannot direct the ship unless you know where you're going. You need to know your destination. Then this tongue, the rudder, will take you there as you speak it forth. As you guard against everything negative coming out of your mouth. You guard that ship to the haven, the port. The finishing of your destiny. And it all rests on your tongue. But you cannot speak that out until you know the word of the Lord. You cannot call your destiny forth unless you know it. It is time to seek the Lord. Time is short. And if you don't do this, you'll be in real trouble. If you don't do this, you'll drift through the next two, three years and just fall out of timing. Very difficult to get back on the road because of the acceleration that is taking place. A few years ago, you could go around the mountain and get back on the track. Not anymore. We can't afford to fall off the track. I want you to take this seriously because... It's really important. You are a creative being. You have very powerful creative abilities within you. But it has to be with the word of the Lord in your mouth. All this stuff is laid up for you to fulfill your destiny. Great mantles, great provision are going to be accomplished over the next few years. You need to know where you're supposed to go, what your destiny is. And we're going to pray in a moment that this will happen. But, you know, you've got to be serious about this. If you don't know, clearly, seek. Put time aside. Make it a priority to find out so that God might unfold, unfold to you what your destiny is. We're going to pray now. But I want you to be very serious about this. Okay, I'm going to pray that God will begin to unfold to you some understanding of what your purpose is over these next few years. I'll pray that tonight, but it's very, very important that you continue to seek the Lord with all of your heart for this thing to begin to unfold to you in real clarity. So let us pray. Lord, we've been talking about how you made us in your image and in your likeness and how that you are a creator. And because we are in your image and likeness, we are creators. We are like you. And the words of our mouth determine the world, our personal and private world in which we live, determines what happens around us. 
Lord, this generation is a generation of destiny. These people need to know their destiny. If they don't already know, they need to know their destiny. I pray, Lord, that as people will connect with me now as I pray, that, Father, you will begin to unfold to them, give them insight and understanding to their destinies, give them wisdom to understand, give them an ear to hear what you're saying to them in this hour. I pray for a special grace to be over their minds and hearts that they will be able to hear and understand. I pray that you'll speak to them in dreams. Give them visions, Lord. Speak to them in dreams. Let there be an unfolding, Lord. I just release to them now. I release grace to them to be able to hear and understand what you are calling them to so that, Lord, they may be able to dream the outline their lives into it and speak it and continue to speak it forth to see them in their destiny, to see them walking in it. They see it in their hearts, they speak it with their mouth, they feel it in their emotions. I just, Lord, release that grace to them now in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. He in hearts to respond that we will allow the Spirit of the Lord to train us Bring us to that place where he can trust us. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you today.